subject it is to provide you with uh, information on how to participate uh, to um, IMI call, what are the funding rules, uh, how does it work from an intellectual property point of view, because it's very important uh, to anticipate um, most of the legal questions when participating uh, to IMI to um, activities. But also MAGDA will provide you more practical information on how it works from the launch of the call until uh, the grant is awarded for the successful application, some tips to write successful proposal, and also more information. So, but let's start with the participation rules. So as you might be all uh, aware, so IMI is now fully under the umbrella of H2020. So part of our budget is coming for, from the H2020 uh, Research and Innovation Program of the European Union. And we are subject to the H2020 participation rules and dissemination. We are subject to the EU financial regulation. And IMI, as part of one of the public-private partnerships, is also together with other uh, under this single set of rules. But of course, uh, for this initiative, and especially for the Innovative Medicine Initiative, there were a need to adapt some of the provisions considering the public-private partnership nature of this initiative, especially concerning the entity eligible for funding, but also with regard to intellectual property. So all the legislation is available on our website and you should refer, as I mentioned, to the H2020 participation rules, but also to the Commission delegated regulation applicable to the Innovative Medicine Initiative in terms of legal basis for participation and funding rules. Should you have any issue in accessing to this document, please feel free to contact us. So in terms of participation rules, right now, so uh, the question is how to be involved in an IMI project. So of course, uh, we will develop further on how you can be a partner in an IMI project. But you also should be aware that joining IMI may be done through different routes. So uh, we have FPR being a full member. This is the fourth option. You can also be involved uh, um, in IMI through an FPR membership indirect membership or direct membership as a research partner uh, to SPIA. But some of organizations participating to IMI activities are associated partners. We have currently this, this case with the joint uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation participating to our diabetes project. We have also the Enflet Trust Foundation participating also uh, to uh, our diabetes uh, topic, but we have also now the participation of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation participating to the first disease vaccine topic. But as an applicant and with the launch of the fifth call, I think you are most interested on how to become a participant to an IMI project and who can participate. So IMI, the scope of IMI is much more broader than uh, IMI one, and consequently. Um, the area covered by the IMI strategic research agenda is wider and it's multidisciplinary. That's the reason why clearly it was necessary to make sure that any legal entity, regardless its place of establishment, it means that here in terms of participation, we do not limit the participation possibility to entity established in Europe, but any legal entity, regardless its place of establishment, and carrying out work relevant to the core objective may be part of an applicant consortium. So it means that entity based in Europe, entity based outside Europe, may clearly be part of an applicant. Uh, consortium. It, you have when defining your consortium, when setting up your consortium, it is important to consider what is necessary concerning the, part, the call objective in terms of number of participants and expertise, as mentioned, based on the proposal objective, the expected result, and what is required in the pool topic text. So very important when forming your consortium to make sure that uh, you, have, you will uh, collect all the necessary expertise to answer to what is mentioned in the context. Why is it open? Not only because uh, it's open, not only because uh, the scope is much more ambitious than in the past, but also we have to make sure that we, act, we may attract all the relevant stakeholders in order to make sure that idea get from the laboratory to the patient and also to the market. We also need good science, the best science, 
also to result in good regulation. So when referring to an illegal entity, we are not necessarily only referring to scientific organization or industrial partner, but also to patient organization, to regulatory authority, to health technology assessment body. Very, very important to have a wider view than in the past. That it doesn't mean that all these entities being part of an applicant consortium will be eligible to receive IMI funding. And this is one of the major differences compared to H 2020. In terms of eligibility for funding, of course, uh, will be eligible the academic institutions, the small and medium sized enterprise, the non for profit organization, including the patient organization, the regulatory uh, authority. But one of the novelty of IMI is also to make sure that mid sized enterprise with an annual turnover of less than 5,000 million euros per year will be eligible for funding. Because in the past, they were refrained to participate. They refrained themselves to participate in IMI projects because they had to participate with their own resources. And we have to make sure, as I, as I mentioned before, that we will be in a position to attract the most relevant stakeholder, and we should not refrain participation based on financial elements. That's the reason why the member states fully agree to have this organization, this mid-sized enterprise, eligible for funding. All these entities shall be established in a member state or in a country associated to the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program of the European Union. For all the other countries, as I mentioned from my previous slides, they are welcome to participate. It doesn't mean, so as a principle, they are not eligible for funding, but this might be agreed on a case-by-case -case basis, based on two different elements. Either because this was clearly stated for the, in the call document, and this was notably the case of our Ebola Plus, Ebola Plus uh, call, where it was clearly recognized, acknowledged, the need of financially supported entity established uh, in um, the area that are concerned uh, by this um, Epidemic. But also, during the evaluation, the, the, the expert may consider that the participation is essential for the right carrying out of the action and consequently to make sure that this entity may be eligible for funding. We have exactly um, some of similar situations in H2020. So as a principle, only those organizations established in Europe and associated the country are eligible, but there may be case-by-case basis decision for those countries not um, established uh, in Europe. In terms of condition for, for in terms of condition for participation, sorry. So here we are fully aligned with H2020 and this is one of the first results of this alignment. So in terms of minimum condition for participation for research and innovation action. And if we take the example of the fifth call, all the topic will be implemented through research and innovation action. So it means that as a minimum, at least three legal entities established in different member states or associated countries should be part of the applicant's consortium. But minimum condition does not mean that you will reach a critical mass, considering the call objective, considering the expertise required. So the minimum of three is a minimum. And it's an important minimum in which sense? Because it's an eligibility question. It means that the consortium without this three legal entity established in different member states and associated countries will not be eligible even for evaluation. So that's very important. So you may have a consortium of 10 legal entities, but if you have only two different states represented, this uh, application will not be eligible. So quite simple rule. Illegal entities established in different member states or country associated to H 2020. There might be additional conditions uh, provided in the annual work plan, but for the call file, there is no additional condition. So just stick to this minimum of at least three legal entities established in different member states or associated countries. In terms of expected consortia, at stage one, so when you will prepare your short proposal in answering to one of the topics of the fifth call. So we are expecting consortia form of entity eligible for IMI funding, carrying out activity relevant for achieving the project objective, but also any other legal entity. Back to my first slide, you remember, any legal entity, regardless of its place of establishment, may participate in an IMI project. 
providing that this entity will carry out activities relevant for achieving the project objective. So you can have different types of entities established in different countries, so you just have to respect at minimum this minimum of three legal entities. But now, in terms of funding rule, because I know participating in my, in my project is really great, but you might be more interested in knowing how much you might get by participating in an IMI project. So, again, one of the direct consequences of being fully under the umbrella of the H2020 program is that now we have one single funding rate per project, meaning that for research and innovation action, for all the beneficiaries and for all the activities, there will be one single funding rate of 100% of the total direct eligible cost. This is clear. This is simple, simpler compared to the past. So one single funding rate for the direct eligible cost. And all the costs will be reported by all the participants considering their accounting and management principles with wider acceptance of average personal cost, with the possibility for non-profit organizations to also report up to 8,000 euros per year and per person for supplementary payment to the staff. So, and less requirement for time record. So this is again a direct consequence of being under the umbrella of H2020. For the cost, as in the past, we will consider the personal cost, the equipment, the consumable, the travel, and the subcontracting activities. But on the top of this 100 person, for the total direct eligible cost, we will also apply one single flat rate for covering the overrate, a flat rate of 25 persons. Again, this is a clear simplification compared to the past where for FP7 you had different, three different flat rates, for IMI1, two different flat rates. Now, H2020, IMI2, one single model, a flat rate of 25% to cover your indirect cost, your overrate. So, if we just take a concrete example, if we have a look, compare, comparing IMI1 and IMI2. So, IMI1, with the same investment of 100, you get in the past only 90. But now, with the same investment of 100, the IMI2 contribution will be of 125. You remember, we apply the single flat rate for the direct cost of 20% plus 25%, 100% is 25%. So this leads to 125. And again, this is fully aligned with Horizon 2020. Nothing different compared to the general um, EU research and innovation program. But I am right, it's not only a question of how much the entity eligible for funding will get. IMI, you know, that is a public-private partnership. And it means that not only public funds will be invested in our project, but also investment from our industrial partners and associated partners. They will contribute mainly with in-kind contribution, meaning full-time equivalent, but they might also contribute to our project with cash contribution. This will be considered based on their usual management principle and accounting practices, similarly to any other beneficiary. And we may also consider as part of the in-kind contribution, those contributions for the, from the affiliated entity involved in an IMI project. And when it is relevant to the IMI to objective, we might also consider as part of the in-kind contribution resources not only based in Europe, but also non-EU in-kind contribution up to 30% of the total IMI uh, to uh, budget program. So it's at program level. So now you know how to participate. You know that you are more than welcome. You know how much you can get when you are in a successful consortia consortium and you participate in an IMI project. But as I mentioned, one of the other differences compared to H2020 uh, relates to intellectual property. And it's very important when participating in an IMI project to understand how it works. Because this IP policy is one of the essential part of the IMI success. The flexibility provided by our, party, uh, by our IP policy facilitated the negotiation of balanced consortium agreement while achieving the IMI strategic objective. So how does it work? So we have different 
um, principle. Of course, we have to support the European industry. We have to facilitate the participation of all the relevant stakeholders. We have to make sure that the information is disseminated and is accessible, and especially for the patient. But we have also to reward the innovation. So that's the reason why, within a global framework, we have also introduced some flexibility, and we have also a key role played by the IMI office in the sense that the IMI office participates to the negotiation to make sure that the negotiations are balanced, to make sure that the interests of each of the participants are respected, but also, and of course, to make sure that the IMI policy, the basic principles, are requested, uh, are respected. So, in terms of what has been already delivered um, by our project based on this flexibility provided, so the successful outcome of the first phase of operation led IMI to build IP principle based on existing policy while allowing collaboration of the more competitive condition. And this allows notably the possibility uh, to share toxicity data. This is notably the case uh, of our ETOX project. It also helps not only to share toxicity data, but also to facilitate the sharing of clinical uh, trial data. This is notably the case if our, in, of, of, of our new med project in the autism area. It helps also the different IMI participants to validate each other's findings. Let's just take the example of cell line. In some projects, it has been possible to validate cell line and to have the cell line used by our industrial partner. We have also been involved through this flexibility to set up a compound library and a cleaning center. And of, last but not least, our antimicrobial resistance program helps to uh, develop, to facilitate um, the, the development of further clinical trial on existing valuable molecules. So, and everything is in alignment with the overarching H2020 framework. So in practice, I'm used to say, if at the end of this presentation relating to IP, you should keep in mind one slide, everything is there. You have to understand, what do we mean by background? What do we mean by results? And on this background and on these results, you will have to run access rights, but you will also enjoy access rights. So what do we mean by background? Here, we are referring to any pre-existing information necessary to carry out this action that you identify up front. So if the pre-existing information is not, is not clearly identified in the uh, agreement on background, this will not be considered as background. So it has to be identified, it has to be mentioned in writing in an agreement, and it has to be needed for the implementation of the project. There are three conditions for pre-existing information to be considered as background. And once this is identification is done, agree, so you will grant access rights to the other participants for various purposes during the implementation of the action, but also after the end of the action, depending on the purpose. Result, the blue box. Here, we are referring to the knowledge generated through the implementation of the action in relation to the project objective. How does that work? It means that anything generating during an IMI action in relation to the project objective will be considered as result. It means that you have really to well define the project objective because it will have immediately a legal consequence. Very important to understand that anything generated in IMI action in relation to the project objective during the implementation of this action will be considered as result. And again, you will have to grant access right to the other participants, maybe also to some third party after the end of the action, but you will also enjoy access right, and this is clearly the spirit of a collaboration agreement. All the information outside the background and the result will be considered as sidebound. But on this, not this, anything is regulated by IMI2, it is left to the different uh, concert, IMI consortia. In terms of ownership, an important element, because of course, when you come with assets in a project, you would like to know what will happen to the improvement to this asset. And as a basic principle, similarly to IMI2 H2020, the result will belong to the beneficiary who will generate it. This is a general principle. There is, of course, a possibility to agree 
on the possible transfer of ownership of this result generated within an IMI project within the consortium to affiliate and purchaser without a prior notification. And this is one of the major differences between IMI 2 and H2020. There is more flexibility in terms of transfer of ownership within the consortium. And there is no uh, IMI veto in case of transfer of ownership outside EU, contrary to H2020, where you have to ask for the prior permission of the European Commission. For all the other transfer of ownership, you have to agree on how this should take place. So the flexibility is left within the consortium. We wouldn't like to regulate and intervene on this specific matter. But it might be that uh, not only single ownership of results uh, is uh, regulated, but you might have also joint ownership of results in case where it is not possible to ascertain the different contribution of each of the partner involved. In such a case, what is amazing is that H2020 fully aligned with the IMI1 experience. And now we are, of course, fully aligned with H2020. So clearly, what, how does it work? In case of joint ownership, it is possible to have an individual use of the jointly owned result. But of course, you have to priorly inform the other joint owner and you have to compensate the other joint owner. But it doesn't prevent you to use the jointly owned result. That's very important to keep the flexibility and to make sure that anybody that would like to further develop and research on the result generated is in a position to do it. In terms of protection of results, so you know who owns the result, but who uh, will have to protect? And how does that work? So one of the novelty of IMI2 compared to IMI1 is now the beneficiary receiving IMI funding has to protect the result. It doesn't mean that you have to systematically file a patent because trade secret is a mode of protection. But you have to explain this. You will have to justify this you, uh, in your annual report. As a common practice, based on what has been already experienced with the IMI project, we consider that it has to lie with the owner because the owner is in the position to define the most adequate and effective uh, protection measure considering uh, the national legal provisions that are applicable. And when a result is left unprotected, this may be discussed within the consortium, but here again, we do not impose any rule. It's up to the consortium to define how they would like to organize themselves on this specific matter. But you remember back to my first slide when I mentioned once you have identified the background and uh, you have generated the result, you will have to grant some access rights and you will enjoy some access rights on this background and result for different purposes. Of course, the first purpose is for project implementation. This goes without saying. But it may be also to use the result of the background to further develop the result, to further uh, to have further research on the result, but also perhaps to commercialize the result. And clearly, this is one of the peculiarities of IMI. Why in H2020 we have only this concept of exploitation in IMI2? based on the commission delegated regulation, it has been agreed that this concept of exploitation is split into two different, uh, two different purposes. First, the first one, any further development, not only limited to purely academic research, but also commercialization. And depending on the purposes, the access right, at least the condition under which the access right will be granted, may differ. And the next slide is summarizing these different conditions. If you look at the first line for the completion of the action, all the access rights have to, have to be granted on a variety of basis, meaning free of charge. But for research use within the consortium, including beneficiary and affiliates of the beneficiary, they will have to be granted on fair and reasonable terms. What does that mean, fair and reasonable terms? It may also, you may also agree that fair and variety, variety of reports reflect fair and reasonable term. It's really up to you. Fair and reasonable term should not only be limited also to financial conditions. It may also include timing conditions or uh, license, uh, licensing agreement, cross-licensing, patent pooling. So it's really up to each consortium to define what do they mean by fair and reasonable term for this access right granting for research use purposes. 
and the same for the access right to be granted to a third party, you probably will remember one of the basic principles of the IMI policy is to make sure that the result that will be generated will be accessible, will be used, uh, further used after the end of the project. And it might be that none of the partners in an IMI project is in the best position to uh, research through this result. That's the reason why it has been agreed once again by the member states to make sure that after the end of the action, third party may get access under fair and reasonable terms to be agreed by the IMI partner in uh, their internal agreement. And for all the, the commercial use of the background and result, at least the result and the background needed to use the result will have to be negotiated on a case by case basis to respect the financial and business interest of all of the partners involved in an IMI project. Based on the previous experience, it has been proven to be very successful and this has been renewed for IMI too. Access right to third result, as mentioned, it's only after the end of the action. It's very important to understand that it's not during the project implementation. Some specific elements of background may be excluded from this obligation to grant access right, and you have to agree on a time limit. So it means that the time during which this third party may have access to the result and the background needed for using the result. Here we are not talking about commercialization, but only about any further research and development. In terms of granting modalities, all the access rights are granted on written request unless otherwise agreed. This has been notably the case in most of the IMI1 project, and especially for the access right to be granted for completion of the action, where they have removed this additional administrative step. But it's a decision on a case-by-case -case basis for each consortium. The novelty of IMI2 uh, in terms of granting modality resulting from H2020 is that now each consortium has to agree on a time limit for requesting the access. It has to be agreed in the consortium agreement up front. Last but not least, dissemination modality. I've mentioned clearly one of the basic principles of the IMI IMP policy is to make sure that the result will be accessible and disseminated to the scientific community. So, of course, there is no time limit in the grant agreement, similarly to H2020, it's mentioned as soon as reasonably practicable. And you will have to explain what does that mean. So, why you haven't been able, as an example, to disseminate, because you might have valuable uh, reasons, especially in case of patent application, that you cannot disseminate the information until uh, the acceptance of the patent. But in any case, and similarly to H2020, any publication will have to be done in an open access manner. And it means that you have to, you will have to anticipate the budgetary consequences of that because somebody has to pay in the case of an open access, the publisher, the one uh, who wrote the publication will have to make sure that um, this is paid and not by the user. The only condition in terms of dissemination modality, while we have a lot of flexibility in this regard, is to make sure that in any patent application, in any communication, there is systematically the mention of the IMI support and the in-kind contribution from the SPR partners and the associated partners. So all the reference documents, if you get bored in the evening and you would like new bedside books, so please. Don't be shy, you can open the rule for participation, the delegated regulation, the model grant agreement, a document of almost 200 pages, and the annotated grant agreement that will be soon available. But if you have any issue, you can also refer to us. We will be pleased to help you. And on this slide, uh, also highlighted the specific session related to IPR. Now, I will pass uh, the end to Magda, which will provide you with very more practical uh, information from the call launch to the award of the grant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magali. Uh, yes, so we will cover now more pra practical aspects. Uh, if you do decide, uh, and we hope you do, to apply for our um, for proposal. Uh, so the IMI life cycle starts with the topic definition. Uh, and the, the areas in which topics uh, will be coming in IMI are broadly covered in our scientific research agenda, which was set out mostly by our SPR members 
uh, with very broad consultation with uh, all the relevant stakeholders. And also, it needs to be mentioned that the scientific research agenda is based on the latest WHO report. So all the um, diseases and uh, unmet medical need is covered according to that report. Um, then, annually, we define scientific priorities in our annual work plan. So every year, you can have a little bit better idea on what could be coming during the following year. Um, the new uh, governance structure or advisory structure that was incorporated in IMI is the strategic governance groups, which are uh, divided into several different disease areas where the pharma companies interested in those diseases are strategically planning the development of, uh, of uh, topics and they plan alignment of the whole area into more programmatic approach instead of having a collection of different topics and projects which, which do not fit together very well. So we decided that in IMI2 it will be well warranted to have more strategic and comprehensive approach. Uh, those groups also uh, are welcome ideas from the outside scientific community. So if you, are, if you have some good ideas, if you are interested to propose certain research ideas, you can submit those uh, either through IMI website or through SPI website. If those ideas do not fall under any of the strategic governance groups, those will be then reviewed by research director group of SPI. Um, each topic, after it's defined, is then consulted with our member states and scientific committee. And after uh, fine tuning, it's uh, posted on our website and launched, like was just done for COP5. Uh, following that, there is time for consortia to form and apply, uh, which then are evaluated and granted awarded. But I will have some more details on forthcoming slides. Um, of course, there is also a certain contractual agreements that need to be signed before the project starts. So here's a, a typical life cycle uh, graph. You can see uh, some of those steps that I already mentioned. We start with topic definition. Um, the industry together, often together with associated partners, define the topic. Then in uh, stage one, we have proposals submitted to us by applicant consortia, which typically uh, are formed by multiple partners. As Magali mentioned, uh, we rarely, well, really never see consortia which are as small as three members, so the minimum co condition is always met. Um, and we often see many different stakeholders present, uh, like academics, like hospitals, medium or small enterprises, regulators, patient organizations, and so on. And Typically, the type of organization or the type of stakeholder is either suggested in the call topic text uh, or it can be quite easily deducted by the required objectives that need to be met. Uh, so the short proposals are submitted. They are evaluated by uh, independent experts whom we um, enroll and, and hire for, for this purpose. Uh, then the one first-ranked proposal uh, meets and merges with the industry consortium, industry and associated partners when relevant, to form one full consortium, which will then work on the full proposal. The full proposal is much more comprehensive and includes very detailed project plan, as well as uh, contributions from all the different partners, in particular from uh, the companies and associated partners who provide contributions in kind. This proposal is again evaluated at stage two. However, at the second stage, there is no competition anymore because we have only one proposal. And the evaluation is mostly focused on the implementation. Um, again, this is done by independent experts. After successful evaluation, the project is invited to negotiate, to sign all the agreements, and after that, project can start. Uh, I will go very briefly through the evaluation criteria. You can find them on our website uh, on, on the call pages. 
but um, the criteria are fully aligned with the Horizon 2020. There are three different broad criteria, and depending on uh, the, the stage of the evaluation or the uh, type of the call, we could have a one-stage call, but most of the time we have two-stage call, uh, different uh, criteria are used. So for the first stage of the two-stage evaluation, we include excellence and impact. And then for the second stage, all three criteria are taken into account. There are some thresholds and uh, weighting uh, that are applied also to different criteria. As I mentioned, we use independent experts. Uh, the rules state that we have to have minimum of three independent experts, but we typically use uh, five uh, up to eight uh, experts to ensure um, presence of different types of expertise um, and to ensure a very uh, thorough evaluation. The, the novelty in IMI 2 as well as Horizon 2020 is that each proposal is evaluated as is and not what it could be given some modification. So this is very important. And each criteria has a set of sub-criteria which will give you a, a little bit more insight into how your proposals are evaluated. So please make sure to read this and address all those different aspects in your proposal to make sure to give the evaluators all the necessary information. So of course the clarity and the applicability of the objectives uh, listed in the proposal, the credibility of the approach, the soundness and the transdisciplinary considerations, the am ambition and innovation potential of the, of the proposal, and also mobilization of necessary expertise. In terms of impact, that's also very important uh, to highlight in the proposal because not only we are looking for excellent research, but this, these projects need to have impact on European citizens' health and well-being as well as the competitiveness of the, of the industry in Europe. So it is very important to highlight uh, what the impact will be. The third criteria is the quality and efficiency of the implementation, and this one is um, evaluated at the second stage of two-stage process or if we have a one-stage evaluation. So here we look at the project plan. Uh, it needs to be coherent, it needs to be effective, and uh, we look very closely at the appropriate allocation of tasks and the resources. Uh, there needs to be complementarity between uh, participants. We do not like to see redundant participation, and we also like to see how the contributions from different partners, especially public and private, are uh, well uh, included well together. So um, also management structure is very important because those consortia are very large and complex with typically 15, 20, sometimes more partners, and with long timelines and big budgets, it's important to uh, look at risk management and sustainability planning. So all these elements are very important. This is not mentioned on, on this slide, but also the proposals, the full proposals are assessed um, from the perspective of ethical issues. So each proposal is screened uh, by ethical experts. And those aspects also need to be well identified and addressed. Um, if, if they are not, uh, sometimes that could be the, the stopping point for the proposal. Either uh, ethical uh, review might be implemented during the project plan, or if uh, the ethical aspects are not addressed sufficiently, this might uh, make the proposal fail. In terms of timelines, uh, the maximum time to grant is eight months from the submission of full proposal uh, to the grant. So uh, we have five months to inform applicants of the scientific evaluation, and then there's three months uh, period during which the signature of grant agreement takes place. Uh, to speed up the process, we try to validate the legal entities in, par in parallel. Um, there, will, there is a sim simplified model grant agreement which is signed between IMI and the coordinator 
and this is a change in um, nomenclature. In IMI 1, uh, we used to call the lead beneficiary as managing entity. Now, this uh, lead entity is called coordinator, and this is the entity that will be signing the grant agreement with IMI. All the other beneficiaries sign accession forms. So, uh, in terms of consortium agreement, this is another document that the consortium signs, and this is a document to be signed between the partners. IMI doesn't sign this agreement, however, we offer uh, assistance uh, to the partners in case of any questions or um, difficulties uh, with agreeing on certain terms. But uh, this document sets out the rights and obligations of all the partners, especially the governance of the project and the liability on also the IPR. This, of course, needs to comply with the IMI2 model grant agreement. It needs to be signed before IMI signs the grant agreement with the consortium. And it needs to be adapted to specific needs of each IMI project. So as Magali mentioned, there is a lot of different flexibilities, uh, especially with our IP rules, that can be taken advantage of to make sure that the project is implemented in the best way possible and that all the rights and obligations of all the partners are taken care of uh, in an efficient way. Now I will cover some uh, tips and ideas that could help you write successful proposal and this is uh, this has been put together by our team based on the previous experience of things that we have seen um, over 11 calls of proposals that we have launched in IMI 1 and already four in IMI 2. So we have quite an experience so far. So common mistakes. Uh, of course, admissibility and eligibility criteria sometimes are not met. Uh, the big one, uh, it seems very obvious, but uh, still we have uh, cases where the deadline is missed. Uh, that sometimes consortia wait till the last day or last uh, hours or minutes to submit the proposal. If the proposal is out of scope, so it doesn't address really the objective stated in the call, uh, that could be a problem. We try to be quite uh, inclusive and uh, still um, evaluate proposals even, even though they might not be entirely uh, relevant, but sometimes it might be a, I, I, I suppose a mistake if someone submitted a proposal that's completely not relevant. Um, you need to remember to respect the proposal template. Uh, of course, it needs to be a, a document, a Word document or a PDF, not slides. And it needs to include the relevant sections that are requested in the template. And it was already mentioned in the minimum uh, eligibility criteria of the three legal entities that Magali already mentioned. Uh, common mistakes, uh, as already mentioned, sometimes the objectives are not addressed. Sometimes maybe only one objective or some of the objectives not, are not addressed. Keep in mind that this is a very competitive process. IMI uh, projects are very broad in scope, uh, very ambitious. And of course, uh, the evaluation is looking for the best possible consortium because only one goes to the second uh, phase. So of course if uh, one proposal doesn't address all the objectives, the others who do will, will, will have a huge advantage. So this is very important to read the document very carefully and to make sure that all the objectives are addressed and all the relevant expertise is present. This brings me to the second point, which talks about the capabilities or operational capacity of the participating partners. So the relevant expertise needs to be there, and also the entities who are supposed to um, perform certain tasks are capable of doing so. Uh, so that's very important, and we, have a, we do pay attention to that. It often happens that the proposals are scientifically excellent. They might propose really brilliant ideas, but perhaps those ideas are too risky and do not have uh, expected in impact. Keep in mind that IMI is created for a certain purpose, um, and it might not be relevant or appropriate for certain uh, proposals. 
there are other uh, instruments at Horizon 2020 and perhaps IMI is not the right one. You need to look at the IMI objectives and you need to make sure that uh, your ideas uh, are aligned with the objectives of, of the initiative and also objectives of the given call topic. And as I mentioned, if ethical issues are not addressed, this could be uh, detrimental to the proposal. So uh, some tips for you, of course, read all the relevant materials, not only the topic text, but also uh, the, all the documents accompanying uh, the topic text, under, understand the IMI rules and respect them. And if you have any questions, of course, please contact us. We will be happy to help and clarify anything. Um, remember that the reviewers are reading your proposal and whatever you include there, this is what they need to base their evaluation on. So please make sure to very strategically include all the relevant uh, information. Start working early. Uh, we try to publish uh, draft topic text and pre-material as soon as possible to allow for um, possible applicants to start networking, to start planning the proposal. So you have uh, definitely plenty of time, so do not wait uh, till the last minute. And of course, finalize and submit your proposal. And our submission system uh, so far has, uh, has this peculiarity that you have to click twice. So first you finalize your proposal, and then you have to actually submit it. If you don't do so, we do not receive it, and therefore um, your, your proposal will not be evaluated. So make sure to, um, to do this, those necessary steps. Here you have some screenshots of uh, the portal. You can reach our submission um, tool either from the participant portal or directly uh, from IMI website. It is called SOFIA. Submission of Information Application. Um, also on IMI website, you find links to Partner Search Tool, and this is uh, a tool that was developed in order to help potential applicants with networking, with finding one another, uh, with advertising uh, your interest uh, to uh, participate in, in the various uh, various calls. We seem to have a a little technical difficulty, but I think we'll be back uh, momentarily. Okay, we're back. So um, I just wanted to mention, and I want to make it very clear that uh, we at IMI Office do not uh, help applicants uh, come together. This is not our role. Uh, main reason for this is that we simply don't know about uh, proposals being formed or consortia being formed uh, and it would not be feasibly possible to inform everyone and treat everyone fairly therefore we stay out of it this is your responsibility we can only provide you with some tools that can facilitate the networking so you have IMI uh, partner search tool you have uh, fit for health, and then also any other um, internet-based application. More information can be found, of course, on our website. Uh, you can subscribe for our newslet newsletter. You can follow us on social media. You can also advertise your interest in the topics in, on social media. And you can also email us if you have questions or even call us. Uh, this is all very welcome. Your contact points uh, are listed here for general queries um, related to calls for proposals or anything else, you can email InfoDesk. If you have IP-related queries, there is IP Help Desk. And also, uh, it's sometimes a good idea to uh, contact your local point. So uh, IMI has state representative group, uh, which um, all of the member states are represented there. Those people have lots of information. Um, they can help you uh, with, uh, with proposal, with networking, and with rules. Uh, also, uh, Horizon 2020 national contact points uh, could be very useful as well. 
so this is all for me. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, we will be happy to answer them right away. But also, if something doesn't come to mind to you immediately, like I said, email us, call us, uh, contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta and Magali. Now it's time for questions and answers. As mentioned before, there are two ways you can ask your questions. The first one is in writing. Use the question function, type in your text and click send. We will receive and uh, read out loud your questions on a first come, first serve basis. You can also be unmuted if you prefer to ask questions directly to the speakers. In order to do so, please use the yellow hand button uh, to attract our attention and we will unmute you as your turn comes. So now we already have a few questions um, that came in while the presentation uh, was coming to an end. Uh, the first one is from Birgit Christensen. Birgit would like us to elaborate a little bit further on the possibilities to get influence on future topics. Mm -hmm. And maybe Magda, you can be the one providing an answer. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Mm, Alessandra, perhaps you can help yeah. me because uh, is there a link from IMI website to the idea generation page? I think that's the case. Let's check. Maybe when we go to the next question, we will check and so, then so we will send it to everyone. I, to my knowledge, chat. I think it, uh, there is, and Alessandra will check on that and send you a link. But also, if you go to SPIA website, there you will find a link to IMI. And under IMI, besides explaining what IMI is and so on, there is a one a specific uh, button where you can submit. The idea might not, might not be very broad, and an element of this can be incorporated into a bigger project, which has happened already uh, several times. Uh, so just a tip for anyone who might have an idea, keep in mind that to have IMI project, we have to have in-kind contribution from the pharma companies. So that means they have to be interested in the given area, and they have to be interested to invest in this area. So perhaps when you submit your ideas, try to highlight what could be the rele relevance for the pharmaceutical company, for their uh, uh, drug development processes, and so on. So this could help uh, sparkle their interest and uh, help your idea to be, to be uh, met, created into a project. So we have found um, the link, and I think Alessandra will share it with you shortly. Thank you, Magda. Um, next one is a question from Paola Tarroni that also would like to be unmuted so that uh, she can interact with our speakers directly. So Paola's question, first of all, was um, consortium agreement is prepared during negotiation only or draft consortium agreement has to be com submitted in the first stage and is included for the evaluation of the pre-proposal. Uh, Paola, I will unmute you now. Um, so is, is your question correct or is there anything that you would like to further elaborate uh, with our legal manager Magali here? No, thank you. It's perfect. It's uh, clear to me. Hope uh, it's clear also to Magali or, uh, or Magda. So the question was if a draft consortium agreement with the, uh, between the partner as uh, should, to be submitted uh, contextually with the first step of replication. So, um, a draft consortium agreement is not requested to be added to your short proposal and even to the full proposal when you are successfully uh, invited to 
to prepare this full proposal together with the SPR and associated partners. So you don't have to provide us with a chart. What we would like to, to raise right now is uh, to make sure that you anticipate all the legal questions as soon as possible. And of course, you will start um, discussing, really negotiating this consortium agreement only uh, when you are informed that you are successfully invited to the second stage. And you will start uh, discussing the basic principle, the working principle, but also you will start drafting the consortium agreement. But you are not requested to provide us with a draft. It's not a condition uh, of eligibility or admissibility or whatever. But on the other side, this consortium agreement in most of four call is to be finalized and agreed before the signature of the grant agreement. That's the reason why we always make sure that you, when, when you are, once you are successful and you are preparing a full proposal or you are entering into the grant award phases, that you discuss this consortium agreement as soon as possible because in most of the case, IMI will not sign the grant agreement and release the pre-financing without the assurance that the consortium agreement is agreed between the consortium partners. Okay, thank you, very clear. I have another question. You have shown a matrix uh, with a suggestion of the approach to uh, grant uh, access right to within the consortium and outside the consortium to um, results uh, um, obtained during uh, the project execution. And you mentioned access right granted to beneficiaries. And so beneficiaries do include FPA partners. Yes, it does. OK, fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Paola, and thank you, Magali. So now moving on to the next question. It's uh, from Sarah Da Costa. And Sarah would also like to be uh, unmuted. Um, Sarah, can you hear us? I can hear you. Perfect, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank Great. you. Great. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, my, my question was um, when you actually applying in the first place, do you need to have a clinical PhD? As I'm, I'm MA in, in biomedical design. Uh, I, this is not a requirement per se, so mm -hmm. it, it's more about you, your, propo your proposed approach. It's right. more about okay. what, what uh, you are trying to, to do in the project, how relevant it is to what, what the objectives are. Uh, listed in the call topic text, and right. yes, to some extent, uh, the qualifications of the the main uh, PIs who are mm -hmm. submitting the proposals are uh, reviewed. But as mm -hmm. long as your expertise is relevant to what your yes. uh, contributions to the project are will be, uh, that that's fine. So you know, if mm -hmm. somebody said that they will they will conduct clinical studies and turns mm -hmm. out that they, they don't have relevant expertise, they are, I don't know, uh, um, um, airplane engineer, that would raise a flag, but <laughs> it's not uh, that you have to have a clinical PhD or, or something specific like this, as long as your expertise is relevant. And in fact, in IMI projects, we have all types of expertise. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, often required that you have uh, bio biostatisticians, uh, different types yes. of uh, expertise. It depends on the topic. Uh, it really varies. So. Right. That, that's really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, just one moment. I will unmute you. Otherwise, we will keep getting your <laughs> echo. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. OK, now, so on to Matt Hanson. Matt would like to know, uh, do you consider an already funded FP7 or H2020 project as a legal entity eligible for being a partner in an applicant consortium? And if so, are they eligible for funding? So here the question is whether, um, what you refer by FP7 or H2020 project, are you referring to one partner being involved 
in an FP7 or a 2020 project? Are you, are you referring to the project itself? Because are only eligible to participate legal entities with its own legal personality. So, of course, if the project, the FP7 or H 2020 project, end, end up with the setting up of a legal entity, of course, this legal entity with its own legal personality may participate to an IMI project. But I'm afraid that here you are talking about a consortium as such, and a consortium as not doesn't have its own legal personality, cannot be considered as a legal entity itself. So each of the partners of the NSP7 and H2020 project, of course, may be a partner in an applicant consortium. And if this, to repeat myself, if this FP7 or H2020 project is a legal entity with its own personality, it may be a partner in an applicant consortium. But I'm afraid that for most of the case, uh, these are consortium, and as such, consortium are not uh, consortium are not legal entities, and then it will be only through. Uh, the legal entity, the partner of this project, that they will be able to participate in an IMI project. And this is exactly the same rule in SP7 and in H2020. Thank you, Magali, and thanks uh, to Mats. Uh, Mats, I also see that you have raised your hand. I wonder if you want to ask any follow up questions. Can you hear me? Maybe yes, not. I can hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have any other questions, uh, Matt? Yes. So um, I understand that uh, the consortium uh, is not uh, eligible for funding, but uh, partners um, sort of already uh, within the consortium could be. But I've, what I'm asking this because it would be a good way to have a case-based uh, approach as part of to use, but it would be very complex and complicated to involve all the partners to say an FP7 or Horizon 2020 project that is already ongoing. So there might be a possibility to have the coordinating sort of partner to be part of an IMI application. Is that my correct interpretation? Yeah, of course, the coordinator of the FP7 or H2020 project may be, part, may be one of the partners in an applicant consortium, of course. But are there any other partners? Yes, yes. But not, yeah, but not the consortium as such. No, because the point is, uh, similarly to H2020, are only eligible legal entities. So, as mentioned, with legal with a legal personality, and the consortium does not have this legal personality. So that's the reason why in H2020 and in IMI2, uh, this will not be possible as such. So, of course, if the consortium is composed of uh, many, many partners, I might understand the difficulties to, in to, the difficulty to involve all the partners. So, maybe only the coordinator, but... Um, yeah, you have to, to think how you strip to that. But okay, but we'll find a way to, to manage that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Um, now on to Anders, Anders Aldeborn, who is asking, um, we said that it is a mistake to miss, uh, to address ethics issue. According to the IMI2 proposal template, uh, however, ethics issues are not needed in stage one. Uh, so Anders would like to know if his understanding is correct. Uh, yes, this is correct. I was highlighting this point for a stage two proposal. Uh, the, the ethical review or ethical check happens in stage two. So when we receive full proposal, that's when ethical experts evaluate the proposal. And that's where the ethical issues need to be addressed. So uh, perhaps I didn't make myself super clear, but that's, that's the case. Thank you, Martha, and thank you um, for the question. Uh, Sandra, um, uh, Pla would like to know when the SOFIA uh, tool will be open for um, the proposals. Uh, normally that happens uh, right after we launch the call, so probably uh, there could be a, a couple of days delay, uh, but uh, it will be open uh, shortly. 
And normally this information is also available uh, on our website. So we will check it just right now. To be honest, we, we do not remember the date by our. Okay, and uh, while we check this, I will move on uh, to the next question. Uh, Matilde uh, Tersigel would like to know how uh, industrial partners could be involved in the project proposal at phase one. Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you for asking this question because, uh, in fact, you are not supposed to contact the industrial partners. Industrial partners are stated in the call of text. They came up with the idea. And now they are, so to speak, removed from the process uh, to, um, to await for IMI to select the, the, the winning consortium for them. So in fact, it is uh, considered as conflict of interest uh, to contact uh, and interact with, uh, uh, for the uh, industry to interact with potential applicants. They are instructed not to uh, respond to any queries and to direct any uh, questions or any uh, contacts uh, from applicants to us. So anything, any questions are handled by the IMI office. Each of the topics uh, is uh, taken care of by a scientific officer. So if you have questions and if you write to the info desk, you will be directed to the, uh, to the appropriate scientific officer and then you can uh, ask questions either regarding the process, uh, the rules, or the topic itself. So, uh, in fact, the winning consortium, which is selected in stage one, then will merge with the partners from industry, and that's when all the discussions and the integration will happen for the preparation of full proposal. So, for the moment, the only information that you need is in the call topic text, and uh, there is no need um, uh, to contact the industry unless you need clarifications, and then we can provide them to you. And of course, uh, please, uh, it's a very good idea to attend the webinars dedicated to each topic because there you might get uh, a little bit more information uh, about the topic. But other than that, uh, contacts are not uh, encouraged. Thank you, Magda. Um, and also, we would like to get back to the question that Sandra Pla asked before. I see that Sandra left the webinar, but this is maybe of interest uh, for everyone. So the SOFIA tool has already opened. It opened today, and it will stay open until the deadline. So proposals can start being registered from now on up to the deadline, which is 13th of October. And now we move on to the next question by Stefano Xefteris. Uh, Stefano would like to know, if you could clarify again, uh, if representatives from academia, for example, a research lab in a university, can become IMI members? I guess that here you are referring to IMI full members or associated partners. So in such a case, of course, any legal entity may apply to become an IMI member or full member or associated partner. So this will have to be uh, uh, justify, uh, also uh, meaning that it has to be approved by our governing board, but of most important meaning that the academic partner will be part in IMI project, uh, participating with his own resources. Of course, it uh, facilitates as a full partner and associated partner. It means that you are involved in the topic development, but you also participate to the IMI project with your own resources because these resources will be considered as in time control. Solution. But if you were referring to the participation of an academic partner, of an IMI uh, beneficiary, of course, as I mentioned, in the entity eligible to participate and eligible for funding, academic organization, uh, whatever its place of establishment, is eligible to participate and will be automatically eligible for funding if based in Europe or a country associated to H2020. Thanks, Magali. Now, moving on to the next question, Filippo Bucella uh, would like to know if it's possible to have the Ministry of Health as a partner in the consortium for IMI2 code proposals. Yes, it is fully possible. Participation and eligible for funding if established in a member state or associated country. 
Thanks, Magali. Philippe actually participated in uh, a topic webinar and had the question at the time, and we asked him to come back to us during this webinar because you were here. So it's brilliant that uh, we made it happen. Philippe, if you have any other questions, feel free to raise your hand, and we can also unmute you in case you need any more specific details on your case. Um, next one is uh, a question by Almudena Albertus. Uh, she would like to know uh, what is the frequency of the evaluation committee meetings for the IMI idea generator? So there is no special committee for the IMI idea generation. However, either the strategic governance groups review the proposals or the research director group of EFPIA. So the strategic governance groups, there's five or six of them right now, and they typically meet uh, every quarter. Uh, so when you submit your idea, I think there is, there is a certain timeline within which you will receive uh, a reply. I, I believe it's within 60 or 90 days. I don't remember exactly. Uh, as this is handled by the FTA office. And if, the, if your proposal doesn't fall uh, into any of the areas that strategic governance groups take care, then it's uh, handled by research directors group. And th those meetings, I believe, are also three or four times per year. Thanks, Matta. Uh, next question is from uh, Elie Znati. Um, Elie works in a small company specialized in drug delivery and innovative drug development uh, of 15 million euros. They are a subsidiary of a larger group of 800 million euros. He would like to know if the limit of 500 million euros is applicable to the company, although the larger company does not work in the sciences. Um, Apart from our contribution, I think this is well. So, and the question is, where, is to which extent your company is independent uh, from the, the larger group in the sense that um, in terms of sharing, in terms of decision-making process, how much control does the larger group uh, exert, exert on uh, your small company? Is it more than 50% uh, of, um, of the shareholding? Is it more of 50% of uh, the decision-making process? So here clearly the question is well, to which extent your small company is independent from the larger Group because you might be a, a subsidiary of a larger group, but at the end you are sufficiently independent and you will be considered as an independent entity from uh, the larger company. And in such a case, if you are considered sufficiently independent based on this criteria of control, um, you will be able to, to participate and eligible to receive funding if based in Europe or a country associated uh, to H2020. So, but for, for this, you, you can come back to us with a written question with all the, the specific information. And uh, you can also check on, on the Commission website, um, you can check whether you, you are considered as independent. There is a, a check process. I do not remember exactly, but we can find back the, the link and, and send it to you. Thanks, Magali. Uh, next on is uh, uh, Joanna Stewart. She would like to know if original consortia partners can be removed after discussion at stage two. So yes, this can happen. Um, typically, this can be uh, recommended by uh, the independent expert if a redundancy is uh, detected or perhaps if the entities um, listed in the proposal are not, uh, do not have sufficient operational capacity to handle the tasks. It is tricky, of course, to, to uh, de determine that, but it, it is definitely possible. Thank you, Magda. Um, another follow-up question by Anders Aldeborn. Um, refers to us mentioning that associated partners can contribute to IMI2 projects. Um, Andres would like to know if they're supposed to be involved in the stage one proposal or if uh, will they, as the FCA partners, only be involved in stage two? Uh, this is the same this is the same as uh, with FPA partners. Uh, typically, associated partners uh, define their investment into the topic. They do participate in the topic generation, and they uh, provide either in-kind or in-cash contributions 
based on which uh, the IMI contribution is determined. So when the topic is born, let's say, uh, not only the scope of the topic is determined, but also the budget. So based on the level of, of contributions from the companies, if they say, for example, we, would, we are willing to invest 5 million euro in kind from the companies and 2 million euro from the associated partners, based on this figure of 7 million, that's how the IMI budget is set, which the beneficiaries will receive. So uh, that, that's when they come in. Of course, there's also possibility for associated partners to come in later, but if they do not uh, include their contributions uh, before the, uh, our call launching uh, procedure, uh, the, this contribution then is not matched. So of course, they can come in, they're welcome, but uh, there will be no consequence or no increase of the IMI contribution. Thank you, Magda. Now we have two um, Switzerland-related questions. The first one is from Pascal Maister, and the second one is by Nadia Kamen. Um, questions are, when do Switzerland entities stand uh, with regards to funding? And then Nadia added again, um, what about the Swiss-based not-for-profit organization? Can they receive a EU funding under IMI too? So contrary to the seven travel program, Switzerland uh, is uh, not a country associated to H2020. I would say not yet. Uh, this should be sorted out maybe in 2016 or 2017, but no other association agreement has, has been signed between uh, Switzerland and uh, the European Union. The reason why entity uh, Swiss uh, based in, in Switzerland for the time being are not eligible for funding unless uh, during the evaluation their participation is uh, deemed essential or uh, this was clearly already mentioned in the call document. But you have to be informed um, that uh, the Swiss government has decided to systematically financially support entity based in Switzerland if they are part of a successful consortium. So that's uh, the situation. So you do, the Swiss organization will not receive IMI funding as such, but we receive uh, funding, national funding, because part of a successful IMI uh, consortium. Thanks, Magali. And uh, with these questions, we have come to the bottom of our question list. I would encourage you, in case you have any other questions that you would like to ask Magda or Magali, to um, send them in as soon as possible. Um, in the meantime, let me remind you uh, a few details about this call. So as we mentioned before, for those who may have missed the information, the call was launched this morning. Um, Sophia tool is already open. You will find all the information, the link that you have received by chat uh, before on the IMI website. There's a link also from the homepage of the IMI website. Uh, we have run also a series of webinars on each of the call five topics. The webinar presentation, and in most cases also the webinar recordings, is uh, available on the IMI website. You can find again the link in the chat message I sent before. And there's only one topic webinar that has not taken place yet. It will take place next Tuesday on the 14th of July, and it's on the following topic, evolving models of patient engagement and access for early earlier identification of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so in case any of you may be interested in this topic, please feel free to sign up for this webinar, as it's the only one that still has to take place. Um, we have, I think, another one last question by Maria Zlachta. Uh, pardon me. Excuse me, my pronunciation. I'm Italian. <laughs> um, Maria would like to know, um, is a project, um, may a project concern dietary supplements or different substances which are non medicine, um, as for example, designer drugs? So anything is possible, but within the objectives of the topic. So you have to read the objectives of the topic and see if it fits, if it's relevant. Um, IMI doesn't only have projects which deal with uh, therapeutic treatments or medicines. Sometimes different uh, approaches are considered to test different hypotheses or models. For example, we have a project where um, 
uh, to study frailty and sarcopenia as physical <coughs> physical activity intervention and nutritional intervention is tested and to, to check the impact of those interventions on the disease to look for biomarkers and so on. So of course it's possible, but uh, you have to read the course of the text and see if uh, your approach and your idea fits within the objectives and, uh, and expected deliverables of the project. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, Maria, for the question. So Maria, this was the last question of the webinar. Um, we would like to remind you, uh, please use the partner search tool uh, provided by IMI and also the one for Fit for Health. Uh, they're a very good tool for networking with people. You can also use um, the IMI social media channels, especially the LinkedIn group that we have uh, by inquiring that with people you may find someone who is interested in submitting proposal uh, on the same topic as you are. Um, and also, uh, please, in case you are already active in trying to form a consortium for some topic submissions, please, uh, if you have questions, do contact only the IMI <laughs> program office using the address infodesk at imi.europa.eu. We would like to ask you to refrain from contacting the FPA partners. Um, because simply this could eventually create some conflicts of interest that may disqualify you from uh, the competition. So please, all the um, questions should be sent to the IMI program office, either by email or telephone, um, as you wish. We're always happy to help you. The very last question comes in from uh, Gavin Bird. He would like to know if the World Health Organization is eligible to participate as a consortium partner. Yes. Indeed, the World Health Organization is eligible to participate and for funding as an international organization. So, no problem. Thanks, Magali. Thank you, Gavin. And with this, uh, we are going to close this webinar. We thank you all for participating and taking the time and for your interest in NIMI's uh, calls for proposals. Never hesitate to contact us in case you need any more information. And a big thank you to both Magali and Magda for being here with us today. Best of luck with your uh, potential submissions of applications. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>